great. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, and also joining me today is uh, Keely Sapienza, from, a senior consultant from, from Chase. And we're going to be going back and forth a little bit about telling you some of the things that you should be looking at if you have a lot of recurring payments in, in your subscription or reoccurring billing stream. Um, so again, thank you for joining today. We, we know all of you have very busy schedules and we want you to get the most out of this. So please feel free to ask questions as, as Jen said before, and we'll get to those at the end. So our agenda today is actually uh, four things that we're going to cover. Uh, first, we really want to make sure that you come away today to understand the mission critical need for using account updating and maintaining your subscriber continuity. So and we'll get into that in more detail and, and both Keely and I will spend a fair amount of time talking about account updater and what it's good at and, and, and what it's good for and, the, and some of the things that it doesn't quite help you with. Second. We're going to talk about what the benefits of recycling and, and other things that you can look at to optimize payment processing in, in, the, in the recurring stream, stream. Excuse me. And then third, we're going to give you a, a number of examples and recommendations. And finally, as I mentioned before, we're going to answer your question. So first, before we get started, let me, let me set the stage a bit. What are flexible payments or what are recurring payments? What are we talking about here? So a lot of businesses are used to taking one-time payments, and both what we found is that when you start to take a lot more recurring payments where you've got card, credit card information or payment information on file, there are some things that you need to do a little bit differently, and you need to actually look at this a little bit different than, than what you've typically done from a one-time payment. So a recurring payment for goods and services, I mean, many of you online and probably all of you use Netflix or other subscription services like this, so you're very familiar with it. The one thing we won't talk much about today, but, but another type of flexible payment is an installment transaction where your, your payment will, will be broken into pieces. And again, the, the credit card or payment information may be on file and, and hit three times. But again, we're gonna focus much more on the recurring or subscription type uh, of, of transaction. And again, a card on file really just means that there's a relationship between the customer and your business, and it's been established ahead of time online. And that customer submits that payment information for the first sales, and then agrees later on that, to continue to use that particular credit card for a transaction. And again, any of you that, that, that do this today or thinking about doing it today know the value of these flexible payments. I mean. You know, we talk a lot about the customer lifetime value. Having a payment, payment information on file, you know, does a lot for that. It, it delivers a much higher lifetime value. Uh, it decreases sales costs. It, it, it brings that stickiness to the customer, and it removes friction for them having to actually interact with you. So, so there's a lot of positives. What we're going to focus on today are not necessarily those positives, but some of the things that can break down when you have these flexible payments or reoccurring payments in your stream and, and what you can do about it, what kind of actions you should take, what kind of best practices that you should be looking at to optimize this particular payment stream. So one of the big problems, and, and actually there's two, so if you take away two problems with credit cards on file, and this has been particularly difficult in both 2014 and now going into 2015. First off, there's been a number of breaches. And again, many of you on the phone may have experienced this. You may have shopped at Target. You may have shopped at Home Depot. You had your card reissued and it came in the mail. So, so that, was, that was a big hit. And that, so that, that means that anyone that had that payment information on file had, had to do something about it and get it, get it updated. Um, the other thing is there, there's a little chip on this slide, and that's called an EMV chip. It doesn't really matter what, what the, you know, the, the acronym that the industry uses, but all that means is the credit card issuers have had to go out and actually reissue cards with those chips on it in 2015, and actually the deadline to do it was October, but it's still happening. And, and what does that mean for you as, as someone that has customers with, with reoccurring um, credit cards on file? Well, it can mean a lot. So I talked briefly about the breaches, and, and that meant about 40 million credit cards were reissued. And again, these don't happen all at once. So they, they happen over time. In addition, uh, you know, Chase alone switched 17 million cards from MasterCard to Visa in 2014. 
So again, if those cards were on file, that means that, that they changed. And it might just be the expiration date changed, the, the, the actual number of the card changed, but again, that, that's going to mean that that card that you have on file is, is no longer going to be valid. So by the mid-2015, the impact of the breaches have lessened. We don't know when there might be another breach, but now there's been the reissuing of the EMV cards, and now it's starting to have a major impact. I mean, Chase alone uh, issued 90 million EMV cards by, by the early 2016, so this is still happening right now. And that's just Chase. There is about 8,000 issuing banks that issue credit cards in the U.S. So all of those, you know, combine just to say, hey, I've got this great thing with reoccurring uh, payments. I've got these credit cards on file, but the environment around me is changing. So, so what am I going to do about that? And it's great that, to have Keely here from Chase today because she's got some real-world examples. She's going to tell you, you know, things that they're seeing from the ARIA perspective. We have a number of clients that, that we're helping deal with this as well because, again, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a problem that the whole industry is facing, and the more that we can educate and help, the better with best practices. So what are some of the things that you should actually – oh, excuse me. I skipped ahead of myself here. Um, so what are some of the things that you should be looking at for best practices? Number one, you need to know your monthly metrics. And that's actually monitoring your acceptance rates and understanding the reason codes that are coming back from, from the, the cards on file. We know actually some of our uh, merchants here at ARIA, some of our clients, actually have weekly meetings to look at these metrics. So they, don't, they actually do it a little, little, a little more often pace. And at those weekly meetings, they, they look at these metrics, see how they're changing, and then decide for an, an action plan on what to do to address the issues that they're seeing. And they're looking for patterns, they're looking for trends. From that information, they go to the second bullet here in the middle, I've got retry logic. And, and all that means is I'm going to look at these acceptance rates and look at some of the transactions that I may want to retry. And again, Keely's going to get into some more detail about that and some of the things that, that Chase looks at from a best practice. But again, starting with some monthly metrics or, or even weekly metrics, is depending on the size of your business, understanding what transactions you might want to retry and what kind of pace you want to do that. And then finally, starting to use analytics and data to benchmark and to optimize and to spot trends. And unfortunately, this is not a set and forget type uh, program that you have to in place because, again, you've got a changing environment, you have a changing customer base, you have changing payment methods, and all these dynamics are going on at once and they're changing. So you've got to kind of get this foundation down so that you know, I know my monthly metrics, I kind of know how I want to retry, but I'm going to constantly look at it because I'm going to probably going to need to change that. And depending on how dynamic your business is and how many new products and new types of customers that are coming into your stream, that's going to affect it greatly. Um, and, and one of the other things you may even look at and talk to your payment processor or talk to someone like Chase back or Chase about is, even something as simple as your merchant category code that you actually process under can actually change your acceptance rate. So you may want to look at some other merchant category codes. You may, have not, you may not have changed it for a number of years because you're, you, you're still processing under an old business. And now you've introduced new business lines. And you may want to look at actually changing the merchant category code because that may actually help you optimize that, that payment stream. So that's, that's another thing to think about. Um, what I'd like to do now is, is hand it over to Keely, and, and, and she's going to go into some more best practices. And like I said, please feel free to, to, to type in any questions that you have. We'd be glad to answer them. And this is, this is a very dynamic area that, that's changing a lot right now. Uh, and the, the good news is there are a lot more really good tools coming to market to help you with the analytics, to help you actually monitor this, but a lot of it is just paying attention. So paying attention to what's happening and then knowing how, how to act. And, and, and one of the things that, that hopefully Keely will talk about a little bit too is that you need to have the right outreach communications too around this. So reminding your customers, whether it's through email or other channels, 
to update their payment information and, and doing that often through newsletters and other things. So it's not just some of the mechanics on the back end like account updater that we're going to talk about, but it's also on the front end communication that you have to your customer. We even know some, some of our clients that have dedicated 800 numbers, so when they get a decline, they don't go the, through the normal customer support. There's actually a dedicated number with a VIP type person on that phone that answers right away. It, it's a human that takes the new credit card information because that customer is very valuable. They don't want them waiting. And they also have a chance to upsell if it's appropriate. It's not really, I mean, again, what, what they want to do is keep that customer and they want to get their updated payment information. So looking at strategies, again, that fit your business to do things like that are really important. I know in the past, some recurring merchants didn't like to reach out and touch a customer because they felt that if they did, they might cancel. Uh, I kind of have an, a, a contrarian view to that. I think you need to touch your customer as much as possible. I think it's okay if they really want your service, if you're reaching out to them and trying to help them update their payment information and, and have a good relationship with you, I think that, that's really important and something that you should think about. And that would be something as you're looking at these monthly metrics um, to, to discuss internally with your team is what other things can we do to communicate better with our customers so that we're, we get up-to-date information from them, especially their payment information, which without that, you, you know, all, everything else doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. so, so with that, I'm going to uh, pass this over. Um, and with Thanks, that... Bill. Can you hear me? You're, you're very welcome. I can hear you very well. Thanks. Awesome. I want to see if I can make sure I can move this to the next slide. There we go. Um, so I appreciate you having me today. Um, I want to take a step back here real quick and just talk a little bit about uh, your customer engagement. You know, obviously with, with all of these recurring payments, um, installments, the annual subscriptions, the re, uh, repeat customers, you have to have you have to initiate your engagement with them in a positive manner. Uh, but there's also some things that you need to do to make sure that um, in the event that that consumer decides to cancel or in the event that the consumer decides to question a charge, that you've got information on file that will allow you to substantiate your claim for that recurring payment. Because again, with recurring payments, as you continue to process those payments, if a consumer forgets, oh, I didn't remember doing that, did I really sign up for that service? You wanna make sure that you have what's needed to defend yourself if that consumer comes back for a chargeback. So before we get into, you know, how do we manage recurring payments, let's talk about what, hap what you should do up front. And really, first and foremost, when you're um, working with that consumer, you need to make sure that you obtain and retain the complete order information. So everything about that transaction that occurred initially, you want to make sure that you get a hold of it and that you hold on to it at least for the life cycle of that particular agreement. Um, and then obviously beyond that for the length of time that, that you're required to, to hold receipts and um, those types of things based on the associations. You want to know all of the information, what the transaction amount, is it a set amount, is it a, re um, a variable amount based on a particular service that you're offering them, What's the frequency of those charges? Um, you know, when did, how long did the customer say that they were willing to do this? Do you have a, you know, a standard two-year agreement, or are they, you know, signing up for a certain period of time? All of those things are very important to again hold on to and retain in the event that the consumer comes back and comes back and questions the, the charges later. Always make sure to confirm your billing and shipping address um, if you're shipping goods out. When it comes to repeat customers, if you're holding on to, the consumer, to their cardholder data, they're shopping with you often, um, always make sure to give them the opportunity to confirm both the billing addresses as well as the shipping addresses. You want to make sure that that data is up to date and accurate so that um, you're always providing the consumer with the, the service that they need. What are the card payment details that you want to hold on to? Cardholder name, obviously. The card type and account number, ideally in today's world, you've got a token um, as opposed to a card number um, and that you're working with a tokenization provider so that you don't have that clear card information in-house, but that you've got the ability to, to get back to that account number. The card expiration date, and that first time you run that transaction, you want to make sure that you get that card verification value. 
Be mindful of the fact, though, that you cannot store it. You are not allowed to store that piece of sensitive data with the transaction information. Uh, send it on that first transaction, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, to validate that the cardholder actually has that card in hand, but you cannot store it. You always want to provide an email confirmation of every successful payment, whether the consumer is online at the time that they're placing that order, or it's a recurring payment. And so now they, you're going to send them a reminder that says, hey, I went ahead and billed you, or I'm going to bill you. Make sure that you've got that dialogue going on with your consumer. Like Bill mentioned, a lot of customer, a lot of merchants don't like to reach out to their customers, fearful of it, that they're going to possibly decide to, to stop the service. I have to agree with Bill. I like knowing what's going on. I like knowing that uh, my card's going to be charged and, and that my you know services are up to date and, and uh, current. And then you want to make sure that you do send reminders out to your consumers, especially for those annual billings, right? I know me personally, I forget if I've done an annual thing, but I want to know about it so I can be mindful of the fact that it's going to hit my account at a particular point in time. So these are just, again, some of the key components when you initiate that, um, that relationship with that customer. So now that you've got the, the, the customer on the line and you're, you're going uh, to be working with them, what are some of the things that you want to do in order to make sure that the future transactions that you're processing with them are successful? First and foremost, Make sure that the software that you are using to process those payments always flag the transactions with the appropriate uh, recurring payment indicators. That's going to allow the issuer to identify the fact that there has been a previous agreement made. It allows them to reference back to the original transaction if necessary. And it allows you, again, in the case of a dispute, it allows you to go back to the original transaction and say, remember this? This is the establishment of this agreement that I made with them, and this is now just a recurring transaction versus, you know, an independent standalone transaction that they're disagreeing with. You do want to keep your expiration dates on file. Um, if you don't happen to have an expiration date or the expiration date isn't up to date, um, there are some processors, Chase is one of them, that you can send us a, a blank expiration date and we'll pass it on to the issuer. Um, it's always best though to send the expiration date that you have, even if it's expired. Processors are required to send through um, that expiration date and not perform any validation checks on it, other than the fact that it's gotta be a valid year, year, month, month. Um, and let the issuer decide. And if the issuer has recently um, created a new card for that account and the expiration date has been simply updated, for the most part for those recurring transactions, they're going to approve it. Again, as long as, with, as, long as that consumer is still within good standing. Three other key things that you can do for those recurring payments to continue um, to, to ensure that they're successful going forward. Um, and we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail, but utilize authorization recycling, account updater, like Bill mentioned, we'll talk a little bit more about that, and verification type transactions. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more to each one of those items in a minute. Um, some of the other things that you wanna make sure that you're doing, um, always provide that customer with a clear cancellation policy. You want to make sure that they know what that cancellation policy is in the event that they decide to terminate, or again, they decide to charge back an item. Um, you wanna make sure that you have the right defenses in place. Um, let your customers decide what their billing date is. Sometimes, you know, billing date may be easier for them if it's towards the end of the month or towards, the, you know, right at the middle of the month. If you allow your consumers to make those changes, um, you're gonna have a lot, lot happier customers. Always make sure to send an ADS um, with your authorizations. ADS will um, enable you to identify fraudulent transactions, right, a little bit. I mean, it's not a, it's not a fail safe, but it will give you the opportunity to um, identify whether or not that consumer knows uh, their billing address information, but it also reduces the overall expense of that transaction. So you just wanna make sure you do ADS. 
So moving along to account verification messages, what is an account verification? Um, for years, merchants have always done a $1 authorization, um, a status inquiry check. The issuers don't necessarily want that anymore, specifically Visa and MasterCard. Um, they're looking more for the $0 authorization, an account verification that basically just says, hey, is this card on file a valid card? Is there a valid account behind it that where the consumer's in good standing? And oh, by the way, I'd like to send you AVS and CVV2 so that you can make sure that those values are accurate for this account. And that allows me to identify a potential risky transaction. It gives me the opportunity to not hold any funds against this consumer, but get a, an identifier or information regarding the account to know whether or not I want to proceed. Um, one of the other things that can be done with these account verification messages, um, I know Bill, had, Bill and I talked about this before, that there is um, a product identification service that ARIA has, Chase Payment Tech has what's called an enhanced authorization. There are different things that you can do with getting information back on the transaction responses that allow you to see the type of card that it is. One of the things that you want to take a look for is, is this a prepaid card? I don't know if I necessarily want to set up a recurring payment on something that's starting out as a prepaid card. It lets me have an have a opportunity to make a decision up front before setting that card into, into a recurring status. Um, some of the other things, again, it will reduce that open to buy so your customer is not upset because you know their, their account has some ungodly amount of money being held against it, um, all while you still being able to identify a good card versus a, um, a potential fraudulent card. It also, specifically for Visa and MasterCard, will allow you to avoid the fees that they are now levying as it results, as it re is related to an unused authorization. It keeps you from having to send a reversal to re reverse that authorization that you may not settle. So again, these are things that help to reduce your overall expense, all while making that, that interaction with the, with, the, with the consumer a much happier interaction. So account updater, um, Bill talked a little bit about account, account updater, and it really does lock in your customers um, to a point in which uh, it allows a consumer to Set up, set up that recurring payment and to some degree um, set it and forget it, if you will. Now, as, as Bill mentioned, though, as, from a merchant perspective, you don't want to set and forget your items. Um, you need to make sure that you're constantly reviewing, or not constantly, but you're, you're proactively reviewing your, your databases and making sure that the cards that you have on file are valid, and that they're accurate, and that they're, they're always as up-to-date as possible. What account updater does is it will allow you to get up-to-date payment account information, not only an expiration date, but also a card account number change. If the card account was reissued because of my card had originally been lost or stolen, um, or because the card had been reissued from a Visa portfolio to a MasterCard portfolio, those items are notified or they're, they're provided back to you in the account updater process. And it allows you to keep a fluid relationship with that consumer without necessarily having to reach out and you know disrupt the consumer's day and say, hey, you know, I need new card information because I got a decline. So it just it allows you to continue to run quickly and efficiently through your whole processes without having to to do too much um, uh, manual maintenance. The other thing it will allow you to do as well, or it will also provide back to you, is has an account been closed? Right? So let's say you've had a customer that you've been doing business with for, for you know, several months to a year, you know, multiple years, and it just really was a set it and forget it from the consumer's perspective. But if they all of a sudden have closed that account and have moved to another account or closed it for, for other reasons, you will be notified of that so that you can ensure that you're not processing transactions against that closed account. You can also then reach out to that consumer and say, hey, what's been going on, you know? Did you cancel the card? And we've been, you know, you've been my customer for years. So it lets you, again, enhance that relationship that you have with that consumer. 
Um, some of the other things that it will do is it will reduce, again, your overall cost for manual updates and collections, right, where transactions have failed and now you have to do an outreach to that consumer after the fact. Um, especially if you're delivering product, you want to make sure that um, you know, you're not holding up inventory or you haven't shipped it without getting paid. It just helps you to overall uh, reduce your overall expense for operating. And again, my, my favorite is increasing that customer satisfaction, right? I want to know that I don't have to necessarily worry that I got a new card in the mail and who are all the folks that I have to call to make sure that they've got the new card number. And then we'll talk about transaction recycling. So what is transaction recycling? It's another one, it's that third prong, if you will, in the approach of how do I best fulfill my, um, my transaction? So now that I've got good card numbers, I've, I've established a relationship up front, and I've, I've got these card accounts and they've been updated, now I'm running my managed bill or my, my recurring payments. What happens if I get a decline? If I get a decline, you're going to want to make sure that you're reviewing those decline codes to ensure whether or not it is a, what's considered a soft decline or what's considered a hard decline. A soft decline is something where, you know, let's say, for example, I happen to give you my signature debit card, right? So it's a credit card, it's a Visa branded card, but it's hitting my DDA, my actual my deposit account. If that recurring payment goes in and it's right close to payday, but it's a little bit before payday and I really need to get paid before I can pay you, that's going to come back as a soft decline. There aren't enough funds on that account in order to fulfill that payment. What transaction recycling allows you to do is to say, okay, that's a soft decline. They may not have enough money today, but in a couple of days, let me retry that transaction. Not necessarily reaching out to the customer right yet, let me retry the transaction in a few days and see if there's that availability to that fund. So those funds are, are there. And again, you are allowed to try up to four times within 16 calendar days. And that's for anything other than a lost, stolen, or pickup card response code. So always make sure that you're reviewing those response codes, that you know the difference between what are soft and hard declines, um, and then what your actual success rate is when you're recycling, right? So you may have some decline codes that come back and you're attempting to, to recycle them. Unfortunately, in the industry today, there's a lot of um, generic decline codes that you may not necessarily know what the actual reason is behind it. And that trend kind of started when, um, it, when you know, the, the issuer said, you know what, I don't want a fraudster that's using these cards fraudulently or that's just running tests to know what's going on with this particular card number. I, you know, I don't want to be specific. I just want to be very generic about what, what's going on. Those generic codes um, you know, can take up to three tries or you know, follow along to see how those codes work with your retry logic so that you can you know, make sure that you're max maximizing the data that you get back with the attempts that you're trying. Okay. So overall, what are some of the conclusions to what we've talked about here? You want to make sure that you're reviewing your response codes, right? When you're running transactions, review those response codes. Make sure that you retry what you can retry. I know ARIA has a product called the ARIA Workflow, which is, um, allows you to do an auto retry process. Um, there are other um, ways of doing that you, where you can monitor those return codes yourself and just uh, put them into a retry bucket. But you always want to make sure that you're doing that. Again, those credit floor limits, like I talked about, um, where you're hitting my DDA just before payday, um, you want to make sure that you, you're attempting to try those a couple of days later. Give that consumer an opportunity to, to regain those funds on that card or that in, in that account. Once you've gotten your baseline for your acceptances, um, you know, focus on the, that retry logic. Look into account updater. If, you, if you're not using account updater today, and you're seeing what's going on in your, in, in your overall transaction and card base, investigate. Maybe account updater might be the right solution to enable you to reduce some of those declines that you're, that you're potentially seeing. And then you do always want to make sure that you're using the appropriate customer messaging after a decline code. Be forthcoming. Let them know why did this fail, what is it that we need to do, what can we do to make this transaction go through. Um, how do you want to reach out to them via email, make it a phone call, whatever. Just always make sure that you're communicating with your consumers. 
And then finally, you know, what are some of the things that you want to think about when you're looking at your overall business model and your overall transaction process flow? What are the things that, that need to come to mind when you're looking for a processor, looking for a software application to, to support your business? Um, you know, do you have more declines with a monthly versus an annual recurring subscription? Do you only have monthly? Do you have only annual? What are, what's your mix on how all that works and, and how could account updater potentially solve some of those concerns that you have? Um, you know, take a look at your mix, the mixture of your card base. Are they mostly U.S. cards or do you have a lot of internationally issued cards? You know, where are you seeing a higher decline authorization? To Bill's point, you know, we talked about MCC codes. Is the MCC code relevant for your business? Are you submitting through appropriate data necessary for, um, you know, for if you're a U.S.-based merchant but you're selling internationally? Is it potentially the country of, of origin for that card? Is there a reason that perhaps um, that, that particular transaction cannot be approved? What are those reasons? Take a look at them. How can you resolve them? Um, does your, how does your tokenization partner submit the transaction? How are you playing with that tokenization partner? I hope you have a tokenization partner um, so that you're getting rid of that clear card information out of your environment. Um, account updates, again, we talked about that. What's your, you know, based on your billing cycles, what's the best schedule for doing those account updates? Um, you know, when's it right, when's it right time to update uh, card information or expiration dates and so forth? Enhanced authorization, again, I mentioned about ARIA, it's got, a, got the ability to send you back the, the card type, Chase Payment Tech does as well. What does that mean? Well, going back to, is it a prepaid card? Is it a purchasing card or a corporate card, in which case maybe I have the opportunity to send in level two, level three data so that I get a better interchange rate as a result? Um, and if it is a prepaid card, do I want to reject that prepaid card for the recurring nature of it, maybe the initial payment, but how do I want to script that back to my customer? Also, from an affluent um, type card perspective, that's one of the things that, that you can identify and say, oh, can I upsell this particular customer? Uh, maybe there's some additional services that I, I think I might be able to, to offer them. Um, and again, what's your transaction recycling logic? Do you accept prepaids? Do you want to accept prepaids? How does that fit into your business world? And again, passing level two and level three data um, specifically to re help reduce that overall interchange expense, as well as providing your consumers with the information that they need uh, when it goes when it comes back to um, corporate and purchasing card expenses. I think that was my last page, so I'm going to turn it back over to Bill. Great, there that, we go. thank, thank you, thank you, Keely. That that was that was great. We have, we have a lot of questions, and I, and I wanted, if, if you don't mind, actually, I'm going to go back one slide. Mm -hmm. um, and for some of the people that, that are on the line that may not be familiar with, with some of the terms we went through rather quickly, I'm going to backtrack a little bit and, and, and give a little bit of context. One, for Account Updater, uh, the cards that Account Updater is available for is primarily Visa and MasterCard, although it, it can be available for American Express as well, and, and you need to check with your payment processor. But primarily, it's, it's Visa and MasterCard. Uh, and how it how it works is, and, and go ahead. Uh, so Haley, yeah, and, I was going to say. In there. Yeah. yeah. So Visa, MasterCard, definitely um, not all countries, um, not all right. not all yeah. issuers in all countries participate in the program. Um, a mass majority of the U.S. issuers do participate, and it's it's growing. Um, but it's definitely Visa MasterCard. American Express currently has more of a merchant to American Express product, not necessarily a processor product, although I know we, along with several other processors, are pushing them to enable us to support that service for our merchants. Um, and then Discover does have a, an account updater program. Um, we are working with Discover to get that incorporated. I, I don't have any timeline specifically from a Chase perspective, but Discover does have a program. Um, that would enable you to, to do account updates on those. <clears throat> Great. That, that's, that's really helpful. I think the other thing to keep in mind, too, I think I mentioned before in the presentation, there's about 8,000 issuing banks approximately in the U.S. that issue the credit cards, and primarily their Visa and MasterCard. And what happens is they've got to update those records to Visa 
to Visa and MasterCard, and there's some time lag, and the time lag varies a lot from issuing bank to issuing bank. So even though they may have reissued a card, it may not be in the system yet. So, you know, understanding that cycle, especially for your type of customer and your particular business, and, and, and getting better at it helps a lot. It, um, Keely talked a little bit about the timing of, of when you go out for an update. So again, it, it's gonna vary a little bit from business to business, but starting to understand that helps. And again, it, you don't get charged for account update or unless there's a match, unless you actually get something coming back. So it's okay to do it often. And especially in this environment right now, it's something you might wanna look at and, and again, understand for, from the timing of, you, of your particular business uh, how, how often to do it. And again, that there is a lag time. So, so some of our clients will some say, hey, I sent out for an account update and I, I didn't get any change back, but I, I think I know that that card for that particular you know, consumer changed, how come? And then that's the reason. So um, you look at some of, some of the other good questions we have here. Oh, I, I know before I do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about level two and level three data, just in case, again, people uh, as part of the webinar don't, aren't familiar with that or haven't dealt with that. For purchasing cards, for corporate cards, there, there's more data that you can send to, to Visa, MasterCard, and, and to American Express called level two and level three data, which is meant for corporate cards and gives you better rates and gives more information on the credit card statement so that it looks more like a traditional uh, PO or invoice that you would get in a purchasing situation. So, that, so that's where that comes into play. It's, it's mainly business, it is business to business. And again, it, it just supplies more information throughout, and by supplying more information, you get better rates. Uh, did, I, did I miss anything on, on that one? Nope, I think you did great. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay. And then on, on prepaid cards, uh, I wanted to talk about two types. Uh, there's reloadable prepaid cards, which means, again, that, that that particular prepaid card can get reloaded over and over again, versus a, a one-time or non-reloadable prepaid card. So, so there's a pretty big difference because people are starting to get paid sometimes on a, on a reloadable prepaid type card. It may look like that. So you may want that in your recurring stream, but you may not want to have a non-reloadable prepaid. And there's new products coming in the market over, you know, so, so it's a little confusing. So again, make sure that you really are clear on exactly the type of card. So, uh, one of the questions that we got, and and, and Keely, I think you, this one might be a good one for you. One is is how do you know which banks participate or don't in an account update? Or um, is, is there a way to find that out? Um. You know, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I know we've got some statistics as far as, you know, there being something like 70% of the U.S. visa issuers support it. Um, I was actually just responding to, to Amy Gibson. Um, I hadn't finished the, the type out, but as far as, you know, consumers being upset with their card account information being updated, one of the things that a consumer ought to be doing um, is reading the fine print with their um, their terms and condition of their credit card, the credit card that they have gotten from an issuer. And it does state within that agreement, if that issuer does participate in account update or that they are allowed to provide that update information um, as needed for, you know, the various things that, that happen. So, um, if an issuer does participate, I would imagine that that verbiage is going to be included in those terms and conditions, and if they don't, um, it, it wouldn't be there. I can't commit to that specifically. Uh, Fred, I'm gonna toss it over to Fred. Fred, do you have any idea how a, how a consumer identifies the exact um, issuers that support it? I know that we don't have actually publish a list. At least I don't think we do. Yeah, I, I think your statistic is correct in terms of um, issuer uptake, about 70% of it. Certainly all the major issuers or the big banks do do it. So it tends to be the smaller credit unions and smaller issuers that maybe don't participate. So, yeah. yeah. And I'm sorry, yeah, Fred, that, you, that, might, yeah, that part, so you might want yeah. to introduce Fred. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. So, so thank you. Fred is one of our Chase colleagues. I appreciate you coming on. Um, 
it does get a little confusing, and that's why I wanted to, to also say that depending on the type of issuing bank, it can vary the timing. Again, when you get information back, how much they participate, how quickly they update the information. So again, the major banks and major issuers like a Chase are, do it very often, but again, credit unions and some smaller regional banks don't do it as often. So, so there is not a lot of consistency sometimes. And I, I'll repeat this again, because I think we had another question about how many you know, banks, issuing banks participate. It's about 8,000, I believe. Fred, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's sort of the current statistic that I had. It's about 8,000 8, issuing banks. Yeah, that, that sounds right. We also have a, a published list of all the major banks that participate, and it covers the vast majority of the, of the cardholder population. But again, this is, this is something why it's good to kind of understand your customer mix and your particular type of business and the type of customers that you have. And, and doing some of the upfront work that we talked about before of, of analyzing sort of the types of credit cards that are coming into your payment stream can help you kind of adjust some of this because you got to understand where the credit cards are coming from, you know, what kinds of banks, what kinds of cards. And some of the, the statistics that I've seen before with main, you know, main recurring businesses, about 60% 60, 60 of the cards tend to be Visa and then 30% tend to be MasterCard and 10% tend to be American Express and some Discover. So again, that can vary a lot depending on what your business mix is, but that, that's what I've seen. And again, you know, understanding some of these metrics up front help you a lot and help you determine how to optimize some of these streams. Because let's say for your particular business, that you have a large percentage of Discover cards or a large percentage of Amex cards which is not the norm, then your strategy might be a little bit different. But if you have a, a high percentage, let's say, of Visa cards, then account updater is going to work really well for you because a lot of the particip participating issuing banks, that's a mouthful to say, um, update those cards on a much more frequent, frequent basis. So um, I, I think, again, that, that's helpful. There, there's more questions on here. Let me... Um, Again, keep the questions coming. We appreciate it. And that's why we've left, you know, uh, uh, the time here at the end. So, um, and I'm, here's one. Are there, and, and if yes, what, what are the trade-offs in sending through payment with an acquisition type indicator oh, versus a recurring indicator? Or sometimes it's called an e-commerce indicator. Um, do you want to t take that one, uh, Keely? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Which question yeah, was that again? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's about sending the recurring indicator versus the e-commerce indicator with okay. your payment transaction. Um, yeah. So the e-commerce indicator, there's, from, a, from a functional perspective, from a technical um, layout perspective, there's a single e-commerce indicator, and within that e-commerce e indicator field, there are various options. Um, or values that can be populated there. Um, if it's a single one-time transaction, traditionally like a mail order transaction, you would send in the value of a one. If it's a recurring transaction, it's a subsequent, it's not the first one, but it's a recurring transaction um, that again, you know, you've established that relationship and you're processing the payment again, that's a two. Um, I forget three and four, three and four I think are deferred and installment payments perhaps. Five, six, seven, and eight, um, those are all the enhanced, eight, not so much, but the enhanced, how did I um, initiate that transaction with that consumer? Five being a set authenticated transaction, so um, verified by Visa, MasterCard secure code. Um, I was able to authenticate them. Six is a variation of that authentication and so forth. Seven would be a standard e-commerce indicator with SSL encryption and, you know, basic basic security around it. Um, so it's all part of the same field. It just depends on which transaction it is that you're, you're processing at that particular time and what value you would submit through. Okay, no, that, that's great, thank you. Um, here's another one. Uh, you mentioned that processes, processors are not allowed to do any expiration date front end validations. Is there any difference between US and global processors for this, looking at the expiration what? date? Yeah, so what I will say is from a Chase perspective, 
Um, we process both internet, both U.S., Canada, internationally. We will accept an expiration date um, as long as it is, again, the month value is 0, 01 to 12, and the year value is 0, 01 to 99, right? Month, year, yes. Um, yeah. And we will pass that through to the issuer. We will also accept a blank expiration date and let the issuer decide. It's really up to the issuer at that point as to what they're going to accept um, or decline. I can't speak to other global processors, but that's how Chase would accept it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and this is one that we I hear over and over again, and, and, and we've got a couple questions on this, is um, many of the, the, the client codes or software clients are, are 530, which is the Chase code, but it, it, it comes up as do not honor. Uh, with other processors too, which is a very generic response. What does this really mean, and why do issue you know the issue use this code so much? And you know what can I do as a recurring biller to when I see this code so often? Because I know it makes up the you know the majority of my decline codes, and it doesn't have any specifics. Yeah, and and that kind of goes back to what I was mentioning earlier. You know, we will pass through whatever we get from an issuer. Um, we are regard. But again, we did see, um, you know, a long time ago, it used to be, there was a long laundry list of response codes that were supported. And over the course of time, as fraudsters were getting a hold of that information, like, you know, it declined because of the expiration date, or it declined because there wasn't enough money on the card, or it declined because the, the account wasn't valid. Um, you know, fraud, I, think, I think what was happening was fraudsters were getting smart to those declines and figuring out how to manipulate the, the, a change to that request so that they can ultimately get it approved. So they started to kind of collapse some of their response codes into this generic do not honor. Um, I think we've, we call do not honor as a um, potentially a soft decline code in which you can uh, recycle. And you, again, going back to the tried a couple of times, review those cards and review those transactions and see what your typical going rate is for getting them approved along, as long as you're staying within the requirements for recycling transactions. Um, but again, I think to our perspective, they kind of collapsed some of those because they wanted to try to um, uh, dissuade from manipulating the transaction content to get, in, to get an approval. Yeah, and I, you know, I have some statistics too. I know that, that on the Chase side, you guys have done some analysis when they looked that showed, you know, a lot of times the do not honors ended up being lost or stolen incidents. Um, and then uh, that was about 68% of the time. And then 12% was restricted status, which again means, you know, there's some restriction on that particular card. And, and about 6% was transaction error. So trying to dig into it a little bit deeper, um, but again, retrying it, you know, is, is probably the best strategy and treating it as a soft decline until you get some other, other response back. One of the other things we didn't talk about and something that we've done at ARIA is we started to add within um, our, our billing system a secondary payment method so that someone can put a secondary payment method on file. So for instance, if the first payment method for whatever had, you know, failed, it, it goes to the backup payment. Amazon Amazon's very good at this. Um, they, they can allow you to put a number of payment methods. Um, so that, that's the other thing is to go out and, and as consumers ourselves, we know the companies that we like to deal with that do recurring, uh, you know, whether it's Netflix, I mean, they're, they're, whether or, or Apple or other people, there are, there are a lot that are holding our credit cards. And so as consumers, we can actually look and see which are the ones that we like and, and how they treat us. Um, and I just had an experience, I think it was yesterday, um, with re-entering my CVV code, my security code, for, for uh, iTunes or for Apple. And they'll do that periodically just to check your card. I actually had to update an app or something, and it actually came up and wanted me just to confirm my security code. So they can't store it, yeah. but they can okay, actually. Well, think... Yeah, I'll let Gilly yeah, I've talk had that about experience that a little bit. With... Yeah, with the Amazon. I mean, personally, I've had that experience with Amazon. I didn't change the card. I didn't change, you know, yeah. I probably had just used it within the, the previous 24 hours. I was doing Christmas shopping. 
but I was changing the shipping address. I was sending okay, it to yeah. somebody other than myself. And they wanted yeah. to know what my CDD2 value was because they wanted to make sure my account had not been hijacked by somebody else. I yeah. personally appreciate that. As much of a pain as in the neck as it was, <laughs> I appreciate that, you know, to know yeah. that my stuff is, my card information is safe. Yeah, and there's this, I was just trying to explain this to someone the other day. There's this delicate balancing act between protecting consumers and fraud that's out there and making it very frictionless and easy to, to make payments. And so, you know, as as business owners and people that are actually, you know, helping consumers buy things, we want to make take all the friction out. But on the back end, we want to make sure we're protecting the consumers and, and making it very difficult for fraudsters. And it's, it's hard. It's a delicate balance. So um, that's why, again, looking at this stuff often and just knowing where you stand and then being able to act on it and knowing some of the best practices and sharing, you know, within your particular industry, there are some good industry events and other things, uh, again, that are specific to certain industries that can help you kind of fine-tune how you're dealing with your customers. So again, we talked today pretty generically at, at, a, at a pretty high level. Uh, I think for you to be very successful optimizing, it's very, very helpful to go, go deep into your particular business and industry sector and fine tune it for that. Uh, so if, if we can give you another piece of advice, you know, that would be it. Um, work closely with, with your, your payment processor and your, your payment service provider. Um, that, that's, that's another thing that, that's really key. Um, they have a lot of great resources that, that can help you. Um, and, uh, and, and, and again, I think it's, it's just that, that, that constant learning. I'm going to check to see if we can take one or two more questions. I know we keep have, have more coming in, so bear with me for one second as I go through here. Um, we get them all? Okay, cool. Um, here's one on, on, do we have any data on which MCCs provide better approval rates? You know, I've done a little bit of digging before I joined REI, I actually worked at Visa, and so I saw some of the stats. Again, it's, it's pretty industry specific, and it, it's hard to, to sort of generalize, but, but one way to keep in mind is um, that an industry segment, let's say like insurance, where it's a must-have, and that MCC code is gonna gonna have a much higher approval rate for than something that you know, like the ga a gaming MCC code, where it's it's a nice to have. So I, I did see that. I, I, I tended to see rates between um, failure rates between 15 and 25 percent. Um, down to 10 percent was a really really good. And some were up in the 35 to 40 percent failure rate. Um, I'll let Fred chime in a little bit, but again, it's it's very specific to industry. It can be seasonal too, and you should just start to really make sure you're tracking your own. And if you can know other, you know, colleagues in your sort of business segment, they may be able to help you kind of benchmark a little bit. Yeah, well, MCC codes are actually driven by the transaction that's being sent, so. Any given merchant might have different MCC codes based on different areas of their business. And certainly Chase has noticed in analysis of um, some larger merchants, they do get different approval rates, um, positive auth rates, depending on the MCC code being submitted. And that's due to um, fraud settings on the issuing bank side. So if you are a complex merchant and you do have different types of business, like you might have subscriptions or advertising or even components, physical goods, you might notice a difference there. And that's another thing to be aware of when you look at your, your retry logic and your, your general processing environment. So yeah, that's a, that's a summary of that, Bill. Yeah, great. Thank you, Fred. That, that, that's, that's helpful. Um, and again, I think, you know, we're, Every business is a little bit different, but it's something to just be aware of and to, and to watch and to look at it. You can even A-B test a little bit, bit on this. Um, and, and there is, again, this is much more of an art than a science. So again, you know, just getting started and making sure that you're actually monitoring things, again, on, on at least a monthly basis, you're working closely with your payment processor, um, can really help you to just you know, optimize it, and, and as we know, I guess, in, depending on the size of your, um, your subscription um, base, you know, a 1% to 2% improvement is, is a big deal. So 
and the customer experience, the lifetime value of the customer, making sure that you have a better customer experience. You know, there, there's a lot of things that you can do to, to, to make this helpful. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here. We've got a couple minutes left. Uh, we really uh, thank you again for taking the time to, to be with us today. Um, you can learn more about, about ARIA here and more about uh, Chase as well. Um, you can get copies of this and recording if you want to go back to the, the pieces that we talked about today. Um, and again, we thank you for your time and, and, and really appreciate you, you being here. So if you've missed any, I think this is the, the third of a series that we've done, so this is our last kind of payment one for a while. But we've got upcoming webinars too. And uh, again, thank you so much for your time today, and we, we appreciate it.